ever stopped. We were forced to postpone the event and change our venue. Today, the challenges of the past have been overcome and every cloud has a silver lining. We took the opportunity to improve many aspects of the event in terms of scientific, technological and playful goals. Welcome to Italy. Welcome to Rome. The Eternal City is now ready to host all of us for the 15th International Congress on Shoulder and Elbow Surgery from September the 5th to the 8th, 2023. The Congress will be hosted at the Rome Cavalieri, a Waldorf Astoria hotel. Heads of state and big names in entertainment have been here. And to mark the occasion, the venue will welcome us for a majestic experience throughout its flexible conference rooms. The great desire to meet in person and the most convincing, modern and top-notch scientific program will bring a large attendance to Rome 2023 to compare the newest achievements of the most prestigious shoulder and elbow surgery centers worldwide. ICSES is not a scientific society, but a triennial scientific event that welcomes people from all over the world, people who share the passion for this field of surgery. ICSES is a celebration of our work and at the same time, an opportunity to strengthen relationships among us. And all the off-site events will make the Congress even more memorable. A presidential dinner at Caffarelli Terrace, where to admire the capital from one of the most fascinating rooftops. A breathtaking location that will enchant all of us with its magnificent view right on top of the Capitoline Museums. A gala dinner in a beautiful villa within walking distance from the Congress venue. The beautiful Villa Miani, where many cult movie scenes have been shot. A golf tournament at the Aqua Santa Golf Club a unique opportunity for golf lovers to play on one of the most historic and beautiful courses within the country. Not to mention the possibility to schedule a unique visit to the Sistine Chapel, one of the greatest treasures of the Vatican City, decorated with splendid frescoes by Michelangelo. It is hard to believe all the wonders the city of Rome can offer. And to continue the journey, all major cities in Italy are within a short distance. Getting around the country is really easy. Naples, Milan, Turin. So you can take a coffee in Florence during the morning and have dinner in Venice at night. We are expecting to welcome all of you to Rome, looking forward to contributing together the success of the next International Congress on Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2023. Dear Stefano, no more stress. We are ready to welcome our friends in Rome. You're right, Alex. Uh, dear friends, we are waiting for you in 2023. In the past two years, the ICSES organizational machine has never stopped. We were forced to postpone the event and change our venue. Today, the challenges of the past have been overcome and every cloud has a silver lining. We took the opportunity to improve many aspects of the event in terms of scientific, technological and playful goals. Welcome to Italy. Welcome to Rome. The Eternal City is now ready to host all of us for the 15th International Congress on Shoulder and Elbow Surgery 
from September the 5th to the 8th, 2023. The Congress will be hosted at the Rome Cavalieri, a Waldorf Astoria hotel. Heads of state and big names in entertainment have been here. And to mark the occasion, the venue will welcome us. So thank you, everybody. Uh, it's my honor and my pleasure to introduce now uh, our good friends, the lecturer. And everybody knows him, in fact. Uh, his name is Osvendre Lek. Can you add a slide, please? In fact, everybody, we think that we know him, but probably we don't know him very, very well that much. So I'm going to, to I've learned a lot uh, with him. He's always here, in fact. If you are somewhere all over the world, you will, you will, you will have him. Okay. So uh, we have prepared some slide. Uh, the name of the slide is Introduction. We have plenty of time. So in, in fact, we should try to do presentations without PowerPoint. It will be so funny. <laughs> so Osvendre is always here. I, I, I think since I am in the in, in, in shoulder surgeon, I, I already see him. And I have to, I have not prepared that, but I have to say that since I was very, very young, he was very, very kind with me. Always, always here, always kind, always is a builder. He's always tried to, to, to put people uh, together, um, and uh, I'm, I really would like to thank you for that, uh, because um, it's always uh, it's not so easy when you're a young surgeon uh, to be in this kind of congress, and you were you were always there and uh, always here for the young surgeon, and thank you so much. After that, I need my slide. In fact. <laughs> I did, I did. The name is Introduction, five minutes. Now we have only three minutes. <laughs> so in fact, Osvendre is our president, uh, is the president of the IBSES. No, I have no ISB, I have just my brain. <laughs> I don't know Elon Musk anymore. But. So, um, so as we are going to do something different, we are going to do the lecture and then the introduction after the lecture. <laughs> we need to move forward. <laughs> so, please, Osvendre, you will, we will remind this. Without this, we will not remind this, but no. we will remind this. So please give your lecture. And I, I will give your introduction just after because I think I have, I have to do it now. We Thank can you. start another way of introduction, right. Well, uh, it's very kind, but it's not necessary. Uh, now, really, we have to change the uh, screen. It's a special moment for me. Uh, yes, I've been here in the International Congress since 1989, and uh, I've seen several generations in this meeting. And it's a great pleasure to give you, uh, to deliver you the Castle Lecture. And I choose Frozen Shoulder. Is there a consensus in 2023? Well, uh, this is something that uh, we have to understand. This is a dissection joint, very loose joint, capsule, and this is what the pathology is about. But before we go inside the uh, 
the technical points, why Castle Lecture? Who is Lipman Castle, the person behind the title? Well, the young castle, the adult castle, and the old man. He was born in South Africa, and he got his medical degree in London. And he, be, and he was a talented surgeon, an excellent surgeon. And during the war, he joined the army, and uh, there is, it's well described his bravery in saving the life of the brigadier Hackett in, in a place where it was surrounded uh, during the war, in Anheim. And he hiding, he escaped. He was a truly hero, according to history. And he wrote his memories in this book, Surgeons of Arms. Then, he, after the war, he started working with Professor Herbert Seddon, a great person in those days. He, he became professor at the University of London and worked at the uh, Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, editor of JBJS, and believe me, he was one of the early designers of a reverse shoulder prosthesis, probably the most popular uh, subject we, uh, we discussed today. And uh, I'm very pleased to have Roger Emery here with us. Roger gave me this uh, shoulder model uh, directly from a patient that was operated by Castle in the early days. And uh, we started uh, a legacy. Uh, this, uh, this castle uh, prosthesis will be passed to the next uh, lecturer in Vancouver. Uh, but I, I believe we know him better for the first International Congress of Shoulder uh, held in London in 1980 with the help of his close friend, Ian Bale, still alive, living in London. And for that first meeting, believe me, it was just half of this group here present in this small room, and very few uh, faculty members. After this meeting, he wrote many books, many chapters, uh, uh, articles, and he devoted part of his life to help the poor. He established uh, the Castle Traveling Fellowship around Africa, and he was well known for his care of the poor. So, the true spirit of this international board and the International Congress of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery is, belongs to Castle. The one we see today in this room. The spirit we see today in this room. He passed away in 1986, few weeks before the Third International Congress that was held in, uh, in Fukuoka under Fukuda, Takagishi, and Yamamoto. And they decided to, uh, to respect him, giving the, his name in a special lecture, the Castle Lecture, that has been, has been on since then. He was buried, not in London, but in a small cemetery where he fought during the war, Arnheim Osterbeek War Cemetery. He was a professor, a surgeon, a humanist, and a fighter for freedom. So, Lippi Castle person was a hero of war and a hero of shoulder. And please join me respecting his, uh, his history, applauding Castle. <laughs> Thank you. So now we go to talk about frozen shoulder. Is there consensus? This is what I'm trying to, to, to show you here. Uh, from flexible and functional to rigid, painful, and dysfunctional. Uh, 
is frozen shoulder or shall we call adhesive capsulitis? Well, uh, based on the ZACO's consensus, the term is not recommended as it doesn't reflect the pathology process present and the proper term should be frozen shoulder. Uh, then we understand that the expression capsulitis, uh, adhesive capsulitis is growing in the literature. And uh, look at this paper from effort uh, in this past two decades, adhesive capsulitis have more, uh, more citation than even frozen shoulder. And when we look for frozen shoulder in PubMed, uh, we, we get surprised on how big was the interest and number of publications uh, since the uh, pandemic started. And when we punch adhesive capsulitis, the same happens. We have a great number of publications since 2020. But this is a very uh, old description from Duplé, this book I have in my collection. And Duplé said in, in, in the base of this page, not a title, uh, that the name would be uh, scapular humeral periarthritis, then changed to tenobursitis, frozen shoulder, and adhesive capsulitis. And Dr. Kodman, in his book, uh, mentioned that frozen shoulder, it's a condition with pain usually felt near the insertion of the deltoid, inability to sleep on the affected side, painful and incomplete elevation and external rotation, restriction of both spasmodic and mildly adherent type, atrophy of spinati, local tenderness, and x-rays of, of that time was negative, except for bony atrophy. So this is very contemporary. And the Korean colleagues made a consensus in, his, in their society and uh, they define as a self-limiting, painful, and with functional restriction, lasting more than one month with uh, unremarkable x-rays. And then, as this is a international meeting, I went to get the opinion of leaders uh, around the world. And I started uh, with Joe Zuckerman telling us his idea about classification. First, let me congratulate my colleague, Osprandre Lech, on the honor of presenting the Kessel Lecture. We've had an interest in frozen shoulder for a long time. It was evident to us many years ago that when people talked about frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, they weren't really talking about the same thing. So we tried to achieve a consensus definition by asking all the members of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons, including corresponding members, to help us classify and define the entity. So that led to the, the classification of primary frozen shoulder, adhesive capsulitis, and secondary. Because really when we talk about frozen shoulder, it's really the primary form that we're interested in. You know, the secondary forms can have a, a multitude of causes. So our efforts at the defining primary frozen shoulder will really enhance our ability to understand successful treatment approaches. So even now when I read the literature, I think there is some inconsistency in the patients that are described as having adhesive capsulitis. So we still have some work to do and hopefully meetings like the international consensus, rather the international conference on shoulder and elbow problems will help us. All right, so here is what Dr. Zuckman wants to express. 70% uh, would be a primary frozen, and 30% comes secondary frozen. That could be called adhesive capsulitis. Well, is physical examination enough for diagnosis? No, 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 no. We have much more advanced imaging, laboratory, and genetics. When you talk about image, uh, an, uh, ultrasound can help us to understand with tightening of the coracohumeral ligament or increase the vascularity of the rotator interval. Uh, on the MRI, 
it's always thickening of something uh, uh, of this uh, soft tissue. And here you can see easily uh, the axillary pouch and the rotator interval. So when you see thickness, you have less mobility on average. And then we go to genetics. Uh, can genetic explain adhesive capsulites or frozen? Well, uh, my colleague from my colleague from Sao Paulo, who's here, Karina, will tell us her experience on that. So in our journey, we've been studying epidemiologic data where we found a high incidence in first degree relatives. And this made us strongly believe there was the genetic influence in the disease. So we have this research line in genetics. Uh, we study 186 cases of frozen shoulder and 600 controls. And we could point out some uh, independent risk factors uh, in variants of metalloproteinases and also TGF beta reinforcing uh, their paper in the development of the disease. Also from nine cases that went into surgery, you collect the capsule and you could find uh, the high incidence of expression of the tenacine and the fibronectin one in the development of the disease. So there's still a big lack in genetics, but collecting this big data will uh, in future help us uh, to understand better the disease, prevent, and also to treat it as it is need. So, Thanks, Karina. So, frozen shoulder, as we know, it, there is a 306% retraction and inflammation of the capsule. And now let's move to a different topic that sometimes we do not understand. Depression and frozen shoulder. The literature is full of these uh, documents uh, that express the triggering of the nervous system or maybe the sympathetic dystrophy type of condition. And our physiotherapist a friend from Poland who works in Dubai will explain us uh, what she thinks about. Hello everyone, my name is Angelina Lukashenko and I'm a senior physiotherapist at the International Knee and Joint Center in Abu Dhabi. And today I wanna show you that that's the truth, that we have the connection between anxiety level and depression level and predisposition, psychological predisposition of the patient towards anxiety and depression and the frozen shoulder. More predisposition the patient has, it's proved by science, more likely will be able to develop anxiety, uh, more likely will be able to develop a frozen shoulder. And if we are talking about the, how to treat the frozen shoulder in this kind of condition, because we cannot treat and we cannot, as the physios, we cannot prove is it anxiety or depression and how high the level is, we should put more attention on to provide a patient with more safety, more easy exercises, not pushing too much through the pain, just work with the pain and the base level of the pain all the time, pushing a little bit the threshold higher and increasing the range, the range of motion. More patient feel safety, more patient will feel decrease the level of anxiety, better outcome, better range of motion we will have and patient will be satisfied with our treatment. Thank you so much. So, Less range of motion, more pain, uh, sleep, uh, sleep alteration and stress. This all goes around. Now we have uh, also a relation of uh, this pathology with dyslipidema or hyperglycemia, what we call inflammation. There is a, a, a big relation on that. The three phases you know, hyperalgesia, stiffness, and then the frozen. And when it comes to the treatment, oh boy, we go from supervised neglect to multimodal oral analgesia, suprascapular nerve block, corticoid or hyaluronic acid intraarticular inf infiltration, home exercises, physio, acupuncture, hydraulic dist uh, distension, manipulation under anesthesia, arthroscopic release, and much more. So it seems that 
we can go from nothing to everything. And this is what makes so confusing and difficult to understand and treat this condition. In our service, since the early days, this paper was published in 93, we have two priorities, to decrease pain initially and to increase mobility lately, not at the same time. This paper was not well read, but then with the pandemic, it became a hit in the, in the PubMed, it's incredible. So how I decrease pain? With oral corticoid for the patients that can use, uh, opioids, local heat, but no physio at all. We can use patches of lidocaine, pregabalin, duloxetine, the ones you like. And you always treat the metabolic syndrome or uh, related comorbidities. This phase you want to decrease pain. And one of the good experience from our service is to make the suprascapular uh, nerve blocks. You cross a line behind the clavicle, in front of the spine of scapula, and along the coracoid process. You'll have a triangle, and right in the middle of that triangle, you make your, uh, your injection. Or you can use a more modern way of uh, ultrasound. You cross the trapezius, the supraspinatus, and you go to the near the ligament, uh, transverse ligament of the scapula where the nerve is. Uh, this uh, video shows you, uh, with the help of the ultrasound, the needle progressing and going towards that portion. And here we go again around the world and uh, our colleague from uh, Glasgow, Neil Miller, said, uh, uh, published a meta-analysis study of 4,000 patients suggesting that the intraarticular steroid injection should be offered to the patients at the first uh, moment. And well, all this is to decrease pain. And now how we will increase range of motion? Well, this is a good work for the physiotherapist team of the service. And every service has uh, its own programs of increasing range of motion. And again, let's go around and we go to Porto Alegre, uh, south of Brazil, to listen to a physiotherapist, Silviane Vezani. The important point in the rehabilitation of a frozen shoulder is to understand the phase of the pathology presented by Bar Martin Kelly. In a high irritability phase, the focus is on pain-free range of motion exercise and disactivation of the trigger points to manual therapy. In a moderate phase, you can be more aggressive in the range of motion exercise, but still free pain. In a low irritability phase, right now you can be more aggressive in all the exercise, including mobility and strength. Understanding these three phases is a main point of a good rehabilitation. Thank All right. So here's a patient that never went well. She is out three months, severe pain, several treatments. And range of motion doesn't look well. No elevation, no abduction, no rotation. And uh, she has a very poor income. She cannot pay an arthroscopy or something more expensive. So why don't we try something very simple as manipulation under anesthesia? Se houve uma ruptura da cápsula anteroinferior. Repito algumas vezes o mesmo procedimento nesta direção e foi bem sucedido, porque houve uma ruptura audível, o vídeo não capta, mas 
os presentes na sala ouviram esta ruptura. Então, obtemos aqui a elevação completa. Agora, o um outro movimento é a abdução, até 90 graus apenas. Acima disto, corre-se o risco de ter um, uma luxação anterior. Outro movimento importante é a adução para a cápsula posterior inferior. Eu estou novamente ouvindo é, audível o, o romper da cápsula. Okay. Right. So, oh, I don't do this procedure. It's too old. It's too old. I, I'm a very modern surgeon. But here is the patient, uh, four months out after the manipulation. The problem is solved, and she didn't spend much money. That's the important thing in a congress like this. Well, and then we can go to atroscopy, yes. This patient has limited range of motion. Again, atroscopy, we clean all these, we, we release 360, and at the end of the atroscopy, you have this and the problem is solved, as it is here. Uh, and then, almost at the end of my procedure, I want to make a small resume, a small summary, and I bring my good patient from, my good friend from Korea, uh, Young Lee Moon, that many of you know well. What is the frozen shoulder and how to solve the condition? Frozen shoulder is a common condition affecting about 2% of populations caused by a combination of factors, including 1. Injury or inflammation. 2. Reduced blood flow. 3. Collagen change. The diagnosis is made based on the patient's history and physical examination. Several combination of treatments may be helpful for this condition, including 1. Anti-inflammatory medicine can help to reduce pain and inflammation. Cortisone injections may also be helpful. Two, physical therapy and manipulation can help to improve range of motion and strength in the shoulder. Three, surgery is recommended for people who have had frozen shoulder for more than six months or who have not responded to other treatments. Most people with frozen shoulder recover completely with treatment. However, it may take up to two years for the shoulder to fully recover. What is the frozen shoulder? All right, so you can get the 9% good or excellent result with conservative treatments. It's the golden star, uh, standard treatment. Also, you can have the choice for intraarticular cortisone injection, oral medication, manipulation under anesthesia, or arthroscopy. It depends on the uh, decision that you have with the patient. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I will have a surprise for you. Yes, him will talk to us. Lip Kessel is back. <laughs> uh, please consider a patient with loss of range of motion, a patient with comorbidities, comorbidities uh, capsular stiffness is not inflammation. And please consider anal analgesia first and physio later. Is there a consensus in 23 for frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis? No, 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 no. I mean, no, 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 no. And then I finish my lecture. Thank you. So now let's turn to innovation. Right. We are going to do the introduction after the lecture. Perfect. So can you have the slide, please? In fact, they prepare the slide for tomorrow. We were a bit in advance. So as you may know, Svendre is our chair. He's also the chief of the shoulder and elbow. 
and he was the former and the founder of the Brazilian and the Latino American Society for Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. Uh, he has been the vice president uh, for the, this academy. And, but this is only title. Um, everybody knows that, in fact, Ozendre uh, has been uh, taught by uh, our uh, the big master, uh, Charles Neer. And he was the, one of the first fellow of Charles Neer, and uh, as you can see on this picture. But uh, as I told you previously, you always see Osvendre, because Osvendre is very, is very faithful, is always here, and he has participated to at almost all our meeting since 1989. But it's also a huge scientist guy, as you can see here. He has more than 100 uh, papers published, and it's very, very important. And as you can see here, and the second one, he's always very argue with a lot of people in this country, and it's very, very interesting. But most, the most important part of him, I think, and uh, I was not aware of that, but a, a lot of friends of him told that to me, he has an incredible collection of old books. And uh, if, if you have an old book, please have, have a discussion with Osvendre. Is He has more than 2,500 2, books, and it's incredible. So if you speak with him, he always have a good book in his bibliothèque. And finally, and but, but not uh, very important, uh, is a very imp is a very family man. I know him for so many time, and he as well with his family. His son is a uh, uh, MD too, like uh, his wife. So thank you so much, Osvendre, for this lecture. Thank you.